You know, before I get started today, I'll be remiss if I didn't lift up three very special men in my life, uh, three of my spiritual mentors, which, you know, this is how God works. He, he brings me to New York, New Jersey, and I get to walk with three of the most incredible men that I've had the honor of walking with during my time as a disciple. I want to lift up Frank Hines. <laughs> Who, who originally shared his faith with me, called me to be a disciple. I want to lift up Aaron Vishikini. Who, to be quite honest with you, was the first man that truly believed in me and thought that I could go into the ministry. And, and you did an amazing job leading the church uh, this past couple of weeks, bro. And then finally, I want to lift up Corey Blackwell. You know, it's amazing when you meet somebody that is so aligned with the vision that you have. That's somebody that loves the lost as deeply as you do. And I truly believe that there's not one person in this room that loves seeking and saving the lost more than our very own Corey Blackwell. And it's an honor and a privilege to be able to serve in your ministry. You know, before I mess everything up, though, let's go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today just so grateful to be in your presence. Uh, we can feel the Holy Spirit. It's thick in this room, God, and we are just so excited, so fired up to bow down and worship you, God. I pray that today's sermon is impactful, God, that it educates, that it inspires, that everyone here can take at least one thing from my message that they can apply to their lives. I pray that I can become less while you become more. God, I don't even deserve to be up here as times I've thought of myself as the worst of sinners, and yet you chose me and you've chosen everyone else to be here as well. Thank you so, so much for your love, for your grace, and for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen. amen. You know, uh, I woke up today and I chose love. Well, why? Because I'm a disciple, right? Hopefully you did the same. You know, by this, our love, they will know that we are his disciples. But let's be real. That's not how everyone starts their day. And I want to share a story of sin, if you'll let me. There was a man who did evil in the eyes of God. He drank alcohol to the point of blacking out. He was a thief, a liar, a cheater, and a womanizer. He started using, the dr using drugs at the age of 12 and lost his virginity at the age of 15. That man was me. You know, there was a time where I considered myself agnostic, which to be honest with you is like the biggest cop out in the world. It's like, I didn't deny that there was creative design. You look around and how can you, can you not see that there's a creator? I mean, even looking at DNA, it's code. Um, but I just, you know, I, I wanted to walk the line. I considered myself uh, somebody that believed in universalism and moralism. And these ideas, uh, they just mean that basically all you got to do is be a good person and you're going to make it to heaven. But neither of these convictions lead to true salvation. It's a lie from the enemy. Sin, it separates us from God. Sin is basically missing the mark when it comes to righteousness. It's choices we make which are in opposition to God's plan for our lives. But this is not what God wants for our lives. In Isaiah chapter 59, it says, Surely the arm, of the, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities, your sins have separated you from him hearing you. Sin entered the world and it caused death to all people because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, sin has shaped our culture. We live in a hedonistic society engaged strictly in the pursuit of pleasure. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, what's happening today was prophesied 2,000 years ago. 
We are living in the last days. And as sin overtakes man, it is becoming more and more normalized. Picking up in verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. You know, the word of God is alive and active. You'd think as a society, as the years have passed since that scripture was originally written, that we'd have become more righteous and not less. You'd think in 2,000 years, we'd make some progress. But that's not the case. Why is that? It's because sin by nature is like cancer. It grows and it grows and it takes over unless it is cut out. And the only thing that can cut sin out of someone's lives is the power of the word of God. In a recent Gallup poll, it was found that less people believe in God than ever before. And another poll revealed church membership in the U.S. has fallen below 50% for the first time in the history of the country. Well, what's the result of these changes? We've got women objectifying their bodies because men are only fans of sin. Boys growing up without fathers with thoughts only about thoughts. And women killing babies because they have no plan B other than to take a plan B. You know, the love of most has grown cold. No, even if you're not a man or a woman of faith, you can tell that there's something broken with this world. And if you're visiting here today, it's because you're searching for something. And you know that what you're looking for is not out there, but it's in here. You know, we have men dressing like women, putting on costumes, appropriation of gender, minimizing what it truly means to be a woman. I mean, I'm proud to be a man. But I can never relate to a woman and what she goes through. And we have people making mockeries of that. Like you can put on a dress and all of a sudden you're a woman? I mean, what are you talking about? You know, the sin of man is shown through a fallen world. The son of man came to save that fallen world. He came to seek and save the lost. You know, Acts 4 verse 12, a great back pocket scripture for you. Salvation is found in no one else, but there is no other name under heaven given to mankind, which we must be saved. John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, as a preacher, I'm called to proclaim the word of God. I'm I'm not ashamed to preach because that allows me to teach. And most importantly, it gives me the opportunity to reach through the transformative power of God. I'm not here to to hold your hand. I'm here to help heal your heart. So who would like to do a Bible study today? Uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 I don't think you want to hear the word of God today. Anybody from Chicago? It's from my boy, John (laughs) Causey. Please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. You know, Bible studies get us into the church. Bible studies keep us in the church. And if we, start to stir, if we start to stray, Bible studies get us back into the church. 
You know, the Gospel of Mark is often called the action gospel. Mark wants us to know through examples that Jesus has power and authority over all things for all time in heaven and on earth. The physical world, demons, disease, and death. You know, Jesus is out here rebuking pretty much everybody and everything. And, and right before the passage we're about, to, we're about to read, he actually had even rebuked the wind and the waves for ruining a good nap, amen. So we know that Jesus was just getting started. Picking up in verse 1 of Mark chapter 5, it says, They went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes, where Jesus got out of the boat. A man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. Verse 4. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Point number one. Chains that remain. You know, I want to lift up the, the New Jersey Disciples. Are you in the house right now? You know, we've had a number of additions. We had an incredible baptism of Ray on Wednesday. Please pray for Ray. He's actually uh, on an airplane right now to go to Japan. He has dual citizenship in the U.S. and Japan, and one of his dreams is to help plant a church in Japan one day. You know, but, but what I've noticed is that one of the reasons that the ministry has been successful so far in the short amount of time that Cass and I have been here, and I truly believe is we're just getting started. Like, we're just, we're about to really take off. But one of the reasons that we've been successful is because of the bonds that we've been building even before baptism. You know, even, even my own conversion, uh, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, you know, studying the Bible with Frank. And, but, you know, it was not just the Bible studies that converted me. It was the time spent outside of the meetings of the body. It was the building the friendships, the bonds, realizing that, you know, these people, they really cared about me. Two months after I uh, was baptized, my dad passed away. And you know who came to the funeral? The disciples. I saw the love of the kingdom as a young disciple. You know, we all have our struggles, right? Yeah. Amen. I, I see a lot of people nodding their heads. We all go through challenging times. The solution, though, is never to withdraw or look for healing from the world. Only true healing comes from having a relationship with God. And the demon-possessed man... He didn't withdraw. He actually sought out God. He reached out to him because he knew that that was the only way he was going to be healed. You know, in this account, even though the demon-possessed man had broken free from his uh, physical change, chains, he was still spiritually restrained. Similarly, we can overcome certain challenges in our lives, but the shackles are still heavy on our minds. You know, 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Your personal experiences are unique, but your sin is not. This is why our testimonies of overcoming our individual sin is so important. It allows us to share victories with those that we're studying the Bible with so that we can one day help them so they can go and one day help somebody else. You know, I want to just point something out to you. This is the best version of you. That version of you, before you became a disciple, you were not all that. Your life wasn't that awesome. You know, don't, don't be tricked into this, this sinful thought that, you know, oh man, yeah, I had it good when I was, before I was a disciple. You didn't. You were empty. You were hopeless. You were alone. And then a disciple came into your life, taught you that there's something more in this world, and you were radically transformed. You know, we got to open up our lives to each other, and we got to open up our lives to people that we meet. Um, as a disciple, uh, I've been able to overcome countless sins, things that I never thought that I would be able to overcome on my own. 
If you had told me seven years ago that I would be sober, that I would, I mean, you walk around New York, there's like dispensaries everywhere. I mean, everybody's smoking weed. I literally thought that I would spend the rest of my life getting high. I thought there's no way that I'll ever be able to find happiness unless I'm, getting, unless I'm checking out. But now as a disciple, I realize that there's so much more. I was just filling a hole in my soul that was never going to be filled. Let's pick up in verse 6 of our theme scripture. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. No, it's worth repeating. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. He healed people physically, true, but he was more focused on healing people spiritually. Why? Because Jesus made decisions that had eternal consequences. The spiritual lasts forever. You know, I want to lift up my amazing wife, Cassandra. You know, Dr. Cass, as, as many know her as, uh, is such an incredible woman, uh, and she spent much of her life going to school to become a doctor to heal people physically. And that's a, that's a noble cause, right? But she realized that you know, she was just, it's like putting a Band-Aid on, on a wound. It heals it temporarily. And yes, she's been able to help people to live long lives. But you know what's longer than your life? Eternity. I don't care how long, how many multivitamins you're taking. I mean, Corey's probably going to live to be like 130 or something like that. Mostly because of G. But, uh, you know, I don't care how long you live. You're eventually going to die. And, and, and so... What's more important to you? What's happening today or tomorrow or what's happening for eternity? You know, Jesus, he wasn't afraid to mix it up. He didn't back down when it came to preaching the word. There's many accounts of him battling the demonic, such as Matthew 8, 16, which says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. So I got to tell you, are you bold? Are you battle tested? How sharp is your sword? You know, we got to go into strict training. You know who else is meeting right now and, and coming up with a great plan to evangelize the nations? Satan. We got to work even harder than our enemy. You know, even the demons believe James chapter 2. And here they pleaded with Jesus. I think this is like, you know, so funny. I'm like, what are you doing? This shows us that we can know who God is and yet not surrender to him. Faith alone is not enough to save us. We need to invite Jesus into our life. Picking up in verse 9, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. Verse 13, he gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Point two, sacrifice and salvation. You know, there are demon-possessed people all around us every day. Their possession is their oppression, and the solution is submission and transformation. You know, you walked by people today on your way into church. I mean, you, you know what they look like with that, that resting lost face? So shout out to my boy Caleb. They're just, they're totally uh, oblivious to the fact of, of where they're going, what their final destination is. And the demons, you know, they don't play by, play, play by any rules, right? They are an extension of their influencer, Satan. 
Their only purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What type of influencer are you, and who are you influenced by? You know, overcoming evil of any form requires a great sacrifice. We all know 1 John 2 verse 6, those that live in him must live as Jesus did. So we must be like Jesus. Well, what did Jesus do? He set the example by giving the ultimate sacrifice. We are similarly called to sacrifice if we want to be like Jesus. This means our time, our resources, our money. You know, on the lower end, uh, accounting for inflation and how money's changed over the years, pigs would cost around $200 a piece. That means the cost of this one soul ended up being around $400,000. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, look at, you looking at my notes, bro? <laughs> you know, this account gives us an idea of how valuable one soul must be to God. As Aaron said, that's around the same amount as our goal as a church for special missions. So I got to ask you, after all this sacrifice, after all that tagging, making meals and selling, donating plasma, you know, selling your Xbox or your PS5 or whatever you're trying to do to raise special, imagine that the result of all of that work was one person getting baptized. Would it be worth it to you? You know, how many people did you walk by today without sharing your faith? Those lost souls are traveling straight to hell. When we talk about money, do you run towards or do you run away from God? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Your savings isn't saving anyone. Have you ever heard a, a pig die? Like, you know, I, I made the mistake, you know, I'm not a vegetarian, but I made the mistake of watching a, uh, a documentary on how they kind of, you know, harvest, I guess is a nice way of saying it, animals. When a pig gets slaughtered, it screams like a human being. You know, and, and I got to be real. Some of us are squealing like pigs, complaining about our calling as disciples to seek and save the lost. Some of us are squealing and, and, and complaining about special missions. You know why? Because it's not a special mission to you. You're here today because somebody opened their mouth and invited you to church or a Bible talk or, you know, a midweek service. Why would you be so selfish to want to keep that to yourself? No one gets saved without sacrifice, time, money, resources. You know, you might have seen some of us uh, from Jersey wearing these pins. These pins uh, are for uh, anybody that's completed special missions. You know, I want, I want to lift up, you know, all the disciples in Jersey that are working hard to hit their special missions goal. Uh, and, and we're proud of seeking and saving the lost. Are you? Picking up in verse 14, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Now, this is so interesting. Before Jesus' arrival, the villagers didn't seem to mind having a demon-possessed, ranting, tormented man in their midst. Yet now, they're upset. This man had been terrorizing them, doing all sorts of crazy things. But all they could think about was how much money they had lost. Their priorities were backwards. Their personal profit had become their priority. These individuals were more interested in pigs and profit than the people and the profit. You know, and just let's be real. This turn of events parallels what's going on in the world we live in today. Immorality, impurity, greed, 
All these things are glorified in music, movies, media, while Christianity, which stands for righteousness and morality, are persecuted. You can't tell me this doesn't have demonic influence written all over it. Picking up in verse 18 as we close out today's theme scripture, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. My third and final point, go make disciples. You know, we're commissioned. Rather, we are commanded to go make disciples of all nations. But the most effective way of doing this is to focus first on making disciple leaders of this nation. You know, New York City is such an incredible city. It's a modern day Rome in a lot of ways. When we change our city, we are going to change the world. I want to give you a vision. What we are doing here in New York is raising up leaders. The only way we are going to evangelize the East Coast and the Middle East and the entire world is by blooming where we're planted and then growing where we are sent. You might be asking yourself, though, why did Jesus not have the man follow or join him in his ministry? Well, Christ's primary focus at this time was on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, verse 24. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it, is the, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Gentiles were easier converts. The Jews, by nature, were more self-righteous religious types, more stubborn in their ways. If you've ever studied the Bible with somebody who has a religious background, or maybe I'm speaking to you right now, there's a lot of sentimentality. And to be honest, we all have to be really careful of not letting a little bit of Pharisee creep into our lives. Are you looking only for easy converts? Or are you sharing with people who look different than you? My Bible says all nations. And when somebody comes and visits our family here uh, on Sundays, they want to see the kingdom of God. They want to see somebody that looks like them. We got to go after sharing our faith with people that intimidate us. We got to go after sharing our faith with people that are going to be influencers, difference makers. That's the only way we're going to raise up leaders. You know, God's love does not limit but it does have expectations. You know, in Acts chapter 2, we, we learn that those expectations, when Peter preached, were to repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those that Peter preached to were cut to the heart. They were moved by the love they were shown through sacrifice. This converted disciple, the formerly demon-possessed man, was also cut to the heart and was compelled by the love shown to him. As a result, he wanted to do whatever he could to pay it forward. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. 1 John 5, verse 2. And what is God's command that shows we love his children? by going and making disciples. You know, the demon-possessed man, he didn't question why he was saved. He didn't need to go study the scriptures more before accepting God's grace. He was just grateful. And as a result, he followed God's commands. He went and preached the gospel immediately after being saved. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. 
1 Corinthians 9.16. You know what? There's no more baby disciples. I don't want to hear people using that term anymore. You know, baby, baby it basically implies you can't do anything for yourself. There's young disciples, there's maturing disciples, and there's mature disciples. And every single one of you is called to participate in building God's kingdom here in New York and in New Jersey. We have to reach out to the lost. We have to teach them the scriptures. We have to count the cost with them. Why? Because of the two greatest commands. We love God and we love people. As we close out the sermon today, you know, I want to reflect on the account of the demon-possessed man and how it shows that with Jesus, no one is beyond being saved. There are no lost causes, no matter how far someone has strayed. If this man could be restored, then anyone can. This week, I want to challenge everyone here to be healed by Jesus. Spend quality time with God. If you're studying the Bible, prioritize daily contact with the person who invited you out to church. Post your times with God on social media. Spend time talking about Jesus with your coworkers, family, friends, and with those in your family. And if the world is going to flood mainstream media with unrighteousness, then we as believers should flood our timelines with righteous spiritual refreshment. Spend time loving God so you can go out and spend time loving people. There's open individuals out there walking around praying for a disciple to come into their life to help heal them from their personal demons. God wants us to use our testimony to help others. Your testimony is powerful. When was the last time you shared it? A simple practical. Strike up five conversations per day with non-Christians. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide the conversation. That's life evangelism. You know, there's only one way to heaven, but there's many ways to hell. Do you love God? Obey and never fall away. Are you a Christian? Share your faith and pray every day. You know, I started off today's sermon with a story of sin. I want to close with a story of redemption. There is a man who has lived to glorify God. He is drug-free, married, fulfilled, has helped people overcome their personal demons, strives to lead by example in purity and patience. That man is me. You see, at one time, I too was the demon-possessed man. Many of you here were also the demon-possessed man. But if you're a baptized disciple, you've been redeemed, restored, and cleaned of your sin. So I have to ask you, what's your legacy going to be? If you're here today, your story hasn't been completed. It's still being written. You've got the power to amaze and change the world. One lost and then found soul at a time. Everyone here can be personally fruitful. So as we close out, I want you to repeat after me these three lines. Number one, I am surrendered. I am surrendered. Number two, I am chosen. I am chosen. And number three, I am loved. Yes, you are. How are you going to share that love? By showing the world the love of the disciples. And my prayer is that after we've given our whole hearts, that God receives all the glory. And the church said, Amen. Thank you for letting me share.